Commentary. Article One, Section One, General Principles, by William N. S. Craig, Jr. and Naomi Roll. Article One, Section One provides all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in the Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives. The Constitution first vests all federal legislative powers in the representative bicameral Congress. Central to the social compact, this lawmaking institution forms the foundation of the federal government and allows the people's representative to act together for the common good. Article One, Section One establishes several fundamental features of the Congress. One, bicameralism. The framers of the Constitution of 1789 created a powerful national legislature to represent both the people and the states. Yet they also feared its awesome power thereof, and therefore determined to limit that power in order to protect individual liberty. The Western Clause embodied two strategies for limiting Congress power. One strategy was to condition legislation. Upon the agreement of two differently, consi- differently constituted chambers, see the Federalist Number Fifty One, James Madison, was a smaller district, and the short term the House of Representatives was expected to be responsive to we the people. But hasty popular measures could be ameliorated or killed in the Senate. Whose members served for long terms, longer terms, and were selected by the state legislatures until enactment of the Seventeenth Amendment. Two, limited and enumerated powers. As a more explicit limitation, the Constitution vests Congress only with those legislative powers that are herein granted. Unlike state legislatures. They enjoy plenary authority. Congress has authority over only over the subject matter specified in the Constitution, particularly in Article One, Section Eight. Early presidents and Congresses took seriously the limited jurisdiction of the federal government. They assume no federal power to fund internal improvements. For example, they also debated. What powers might be implied by the grant of the enumerated powers? A significant early debate concerned whether Congress could create back the United States. James Madison and Thomas Jefferson argued against such a power, but President Washington ultimately supported Alexander Hamilton's plan for the back, even though the framers had rejected the back incorporation. As enumerated power, the Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of the back and recognized that the enumerated powers include some implied ones in McCulloch v. Maryland, 1819. The New Deal Court expanded upon McCulloch's interpretations,、uh, interpretation of Congress's enumerated powers. The Commerce Clause of Article One, Section Eight, Clause Three, grew into、um, capacious source of congressional authority to regulate the economy, and the necessary and the proper clause at the end of Section Eight was、uh, interpreted to expand Congress authority in the further in Wickard versus Filburn, nineteen forty-two, and the court. Has afforded significant deference to Congress's judgment about how far to press its enumerated powers. Despite expansive interpretation of the commerce power, the principle of the Congress,、uh, the principle of Congress, was it only with limited enumerated powers endures. United States versus Lopez, nineteen ninety five, the court. Invalidated a federal law making it a crime to possess a firearm 
close to a public school. Not only did Congress fail to connect the statute to an enumerated power, but the power asserted, regulation of commerce, was not considered the kind of economic regulation the court had previously sanctioned. Lopez reaffirmed some outer boundary to the federal regulatory power. Three, non-delegation. Article One, Section One. With all legislative powers in Congress, which means the President and the Supreme Court cannot assert legislative authority. See Youngstown Shade and Tube Corporation versus Sawyer, nineteen fifty-two. This marks an important separation of powers between the departments of federal government. It also has been interpreted to include the principle of. A Non-delegation that the people's representatives in Congress must make the law rather than delegate that power to the executive or judicial branch. For most American history, judges and commentators have assumed that Congress cannot delegate legislative authority, and the Supreme Court has located this rule in Article One, Section One. See, example, Weeman versus American Trucking Association Incorporation. 2009, 2001. Individual justices have opined that the non-delegation doctrine ought to be treated as a serious limitation on Congress authority. For example, see Justice Thomas's dissent in Weeman. While the principle of non-delegation persists, the Supreme Court has allowed a lot of delegation so long as Congress in, includes intelligible principles to guide discretion. The Marshall Court ruled that Congress could delegate authority to the federal courts to adopt rules of process. Weeman versus Southard, 1825, and to the president to revise treating privileges. Cargill of the Brand Aurora versus United States, 1813. Also assuming a non-delegation doctrine, no law was invalidated for this reason in the 19th century. In 1935, the Supreme Court invalidated the congressional delegation of lawmaking authority to private institutions. The only occasion where the court has invalidated the law under the non-delegation doctrine, E. L. A. Shutter Porch Corporation v. United States, 1950, 1935, Panama Refining Corporation v. Ryan, 1935. Particularly since the New Deal, Congress often legislates in open-ended terms that it gave substantial authority to executive branch officials and judges. Since 1935, almost all the judges on the Supreme Court have either applied the non-delegation doctrine leniently or to allow large-scale delegations, accompanied by weak limiting principles. Ms. Tritia. Versus the United States, 1989, or have said the doctrine of unconstitutional delegation is not readily enforceable by the courts, such as Scalia's dissent in Mistreta. The court, however, sometimes gives effect to the values undergirding the non-delegation principle through narrow interpretations of statutory delegations. For example, the Supreme Court. Has overruled agency rules adopted pursuant to congressional delegations on the ground that the agency is once seen a big change in policy. We expect Congress to speak clearly if it wishes to assign to an agency decision of one's economic and political significance. Utility Air Regulation Group versus EPA, 2014. Priority opinion, including FDA versus Brown and Williamson Tobacco Corporation, 2000. See also King versus Burwell, 2015. Matter a debate by William N. Escrow Jr.、Um, A professor for jurisprudence from Yale Law School, and、uh, there are、um, 
many contentious issues arising under Article One, Section One, which was Congress with all legislative powers herein granted. I shall argue that the best reading of the West Clause, Article One, Section One, is captured by the concept for a delegation rather than non-delegation doctrine. Under this doctrine, Congress is the supreme lawmaker; and its limits on delegated authority must be strictly observed. The West in Clause text is ambiguous. Even read, even read, in even read in light of the Constitution's structure. See Thomas W. Mario rethinking Article One, Section One from non-delegation to exclusive delegation.、Uh, one might read Article One, Section One to prohibit the Congress from delegating the power to adopt rules having the effect to law of law. A broad reading of legislative powers, or the power to pass statutes, a narrow reading. But one also might read the Western clause to give Congress a supreme authority to make law, including the discretion to delegate lawmaking authority to other officials. As early as the Marshall Court, judges have understood that Congress may delegate to other federal office officials. Powers which the legislature may rightfully exercise itself, including the power to make rules within with abiding legal effects. Weeman versus Southard, 1825. In the last century, the court can confirm that Congress may delegate lawmaking authority to other public officials, but has insisted that Congress lay down by legislative act an intelligible principle to which. The person or body authorized to act is directed to conform. That is G. W. Hampton Jr. and the Corporation versus United States, 1928. Since 1935, the court had never invalidated legislation for violating the so-called non-delegation doctrine. The intelligible principle limitation has either been leniently applied or considered unreviewable. In practice, there is no judicially enforceable non-delegation doctrine. Indeed, Article One, Section One, has been effectively interpreted to establish a delegation doctrine, whereby Congress has a supreme lawmaking authority subject to other constitutional limits, including the authority to, dele to delegate. The Supreme Court's unwillingness to give teeth to a non-delegation principle has potential constitutional costs. It frees Congress to slough off hard policy questions to other officials, and may reduce a democratic accountability for policy making. So, for example, David Schoenborough, power without responsibility. How Congress abuses the people through delegation. But these potential costs might be managed by a. A sober understanding of the delegation doctrine. The standard expression is this one: the legislative power of the United States is vested in the Congress, and the exercise of quasi-legislative authority by government departments and agencies must be rooted in the grant of such power by the Congress and the subject to limitations which that body imposes. Another perspective: This S is a part of discussion about Article One, Section One, with Naomi Rowe, solid professor, law, Antony Scalia, law school, George Mason University. Read the full discussion here. Okay, let's continue. The judges will not readily find a delegation of lawmaking authority, or delegation must usually be explicit. 
More importantly, delegation is subject to the limitations set forth or implicit in the congressional grant or in other statutory provisions. This understanding for the delegation doctrine is the conceptual foundation for the Supreme Court deference to agency rules that have the effect of law. United States versus Mid Corporation, 2001. The calling call understanding the Chevron deference. Deference doctrine, whereby courts defer to agencies' rules of filling in ambiguity in the statute its ministers. See also Chevron USA Incorporation versus Natural Resource Defense Defense Council Incorporation, 1984. Indeed, the democratic accountability concerns with a broad understanding of the delegation doctrine have been addressed by the Supreme Court's review of agency actions. Presumed to delegate lawmaking authority. To begin with, the courts insist that agencies engage in legislative rulemaking, follow the notice and comment procedures demanded by the Administrative Procedure Act, you know, which have been expanded by the court itself. Motor Vehicle Manufacturers Association versus State Farm Mutual Auto in in Corporation. 1983. Additionally, the Supreme Court has inferred article from Article One, Section One, certain crazy constitutional canons for statutory interpretation that limits agency from usurping the power to make big policy moves beyond those authorized by Congress. As Tree Down versus United States, 1989, William and S. Craig Jr. and Philip P. Frickland, crazy constitution law, clear statement rules. And constitutional lawmaking. One such rule of construction is the major questions canon. If when, if Congress has dedicated to an agency general lawmaking or a judiciary power, a judic, a judicatory power, judges presume that the Congress does not delegate its authority to settle. Or amend major social and economic policy decisions. We expect Congress to speak clearly if it wishes to assign to an agency division decision of one's economic and political significance. It is the area regulated called a group versus EPA. Pro opinion, quoting FDA versus Brown of Williamson Tobacco Corporation, 2000. See also King versus Bravel, 2015. The major questions can all give teeth to the Article One, Section One norm of congressional legislative supremacy because it imposes significant limit on agency lawmaking that is consistent with the assumptions of the congressional process. See, Abby, R. Glock, and Lisa Locke Brinsman, statutory interpretation from the inside.、Uh, Empirical study of congressional drafting, delegation, and、uh, uh, statutory interpretation, part one. The primary concern with the major questions known is that it is a standard judges might apply unevenly. But consider the alternative, namely enforcement of a non-delegation doctrine. Lacks enforcement, the Supreme Court's practice, when it even mentions the doctrine, is toothless and possibly worthless. Strict enforcement could impose huge government costs. Statutory interpretation clauses, such as the major questions canon, are probably the best balance the court can render for the Article One, Section One norm. So this is a、uh, another perspective. The article on section one, the non-delegation principle persists by Naomi Roll. Article one, section one, with all legislative powers of the federal government in a bicameral Congress, as explained above. This is often read to include. A、uh, principle that legislative powers cannot be delegated to the other branches, to individual members of Congress, or to private actors, despite 
the Supreme Court lack direct enforcement and Congress transfer power to um, Jewish agencies within the executive branch, I shall explain that the non-delegation principle has stubbornly persisted precisely because of its centrality to a Republican form of government. See Gary Lawson, Delegation and Original Meaning. The Constitution places the lawmaking powers of the government in the representative legislature. Following John Locke, the framers recognize that it is the most legitimate form of government and the one providing the greatest security to liberty and, and the property would waste the lawmaking power in collected, collective bodies of men. John Locke's Second Treatise of Government, 1904. James Madison and others frequently emphasized that the lawmaking must be done by a sufficiently large group, not by an individual or cabal. For the framers, lawmaking by a representative bicameral Congress would serve a number of purposes. First, laws made by the people's representative would have uh, legitimacy derived from the consent of the people. Second, by requiring members of Congress to deliberate and to compromise. The difficult process of lawmaking would promote laws aimed at the general good and equally applicable to all people. Third, laws made by a collective legislature would be more likely to avoid the dangers of small fractions and special interests. Collective lawmaking would not be perfect, but along with other constitutional safeguards, would minimize the dangers of oppressive legislation. Legislation. This feature is reinforced why all legislative powers herein granted are vested in Congress. The centrality of representative legislative powers assess constitutional limits on the delegation of legislative power to the executive, which lacks collective multi member representation necessary for lawmaking. The Supreme Court has consistently enforced the principle of non delegation, recognized that Article 161 of the Constitution wests all legislative powers herein granted in the Congress of the United States. This text permits no delegation of those powers. Women versus American Trucking Association in Corporation 2001, Panama Refining Corporation versus Ryan, 1935. It stated in every case in which the question has been raised, the court has recognized that there are limits of delegation, which there is no constitutional authority to transcend. The non delegation principle serves as important textual and structural limit on the federal government. The Congress and limited and enumerated powers that confine the overall scope and powers of the federal government to better preserve individual liberty. The non-delegation principle enforces limits if wide-scale delegation is permissible as the agencies have discretion to increase the reach of the federal government without going through the difficult process for Bicameralism and the and presentment, presentment. Moreover, non delegation enforces separation powers. Open any delegation allows lawmaking to be combined with law execution and adjudication. In as an agency, the manner then raises the question about political accountability, constitutional limits, and due process. Yet in practice, the non-delegation principle has been for enforced largely in the bridge. Since the New Deal, Congress has increasingly delegated open-ended authority to executive branch agencies, despite the consistent recognition of a principle of non-delegation, the Super Court has tolerated a significant transfer of power from Congress to executive agencies to make regulations. One reason for this is the difficulty of defining an unconstitutional delegation. The executive power includes the power to interpret and to implement the law when applying it to particular cases. However, the executive power does not include the power to make the law. As 
And Justice Blank famously explained the president's power to seize and the laws are faithfully executed refuse the idea that he is to be a lawmaker. And the Constitution is neither silent nor equivocal, uh, equivocal about who shall make laws which the president is to ex execute. The first section of the first article says that all legislative powers here granted shall be vested in the Congress of the United States. Youngstown, Sheets, and Tube Corporations versus Sawyer, 1952. The difficulty arises in determining when the, the executive is legislating, which is impermissible, and when the executive is implementing statutory directives. The court has also declined direct enforcement of the non delegation doctrine because it has analyzed non delegation as a structural principle that should be checked by competition between Congress and the President. As Justice Scalia explained, Congress could delegate lawmaking authority only on the expense of increasing the power of either the President or the courts. The need for delegation would have to be important enough to reduce Congress to aggrandize its primary competitor for political power. Matrice versus United States, 1989. Scalia, Jr., descending. Why would Congress delegate so much power to the president, its rival for political power? Increased political polarization and desire to avoid responsibility for difficult choices provided such some explanation. In addition, delegation may empower members of Congress to control administration by inference, inferencing administrative agencies, allowing them to enhance their individual power through collusion with agencies. See Naomi Roll, administrative collusion, how delegation diminish, diminishes the collective Congress. Delegation may unrival the competitive tension between Congress and the President, undermining an important structural check on legislative power. Why the spread delegation to the, to the executive has weakened Congress as an institution and made it difficult for Congress to check the executive. The unitary executive process uh, process uh, possesses all of the structural advantages of quick action over Congress. Once authority has been delegated to Congress, have fewer mechanisms to oversee the execu executive. Non-delegation remains a principle universally recognized as vital to the integrity and maintenance of the system of government obtained by the Constitution. Field versus Clark, 19, 1892. A few justices have argued for greater enforcement of the non-delegation doctrine to provide a check on executive branch agencies exercising delegated powers. For instance, Justice Thomas had written that the judiciary's failure to enforce non-delegation doctrine comes at the cost of our Constitution and individual liberty it protects. Department of Transportation versus Association of American Railroads, 2015, Thomas Jr. concurring in the judgment. Given the importance of non-delegation, courts should provide greater scrutiny for delegation's legislative power. Yet the non-delegation principle cannot depend solely on judicial review. Congress is vested with the legislative power. Article 1, Section 1 of the Constitution provides for the essential and essential role of Congress in the Republican form of government, even after the rise of the modern updated states. Okay, so that's for the two uh, different perspectives and the common commentary by William N. Eckridge and, uh, and Naomi Roll. Let's finish the commentary on Article 1. Um, Next one, I'm going to go to 
think it's article two. So yeah. Okay. 